Thank you everyone for coming. It is a big crowd. I'm very happy. So, uh, my name's David Beaumont, and I'm going to talk today about the fundamentals of Java Fluent APIs. So, I've worked with Java for a very long time, and worked a long time at Google with the core Java libraries team, and on many libraries, both internal and open source. Uh, if you've heard of it, I implemented I designed and implemented Flogger, which is a Java debug library, uh, fluent Java debug library, logging library. And before Google, I implemented Cleanroom versions of core JDK APIs. So I've seen both sides of good and bad API choices. Um, I believe I understand the value of good APIs, and I've seen the cost of bad ones. Good APIs guide the user through a well-lit path. They give you clearer code, fewer mistakes, and better maintainability. But what is a fluent API? I think people have heard the term. I'm hoping people here are here because they've heard the term, but maybe don't have a really clear definition in their mind of what it means. If you look online, you see various, what you might call descriptions, but they're somewhat vague in a lot of places, and they don't go into great amounts of detail. Um, and Martin Fowler, who developed, uh, coined the term along with Eric Evans in 2005, uh, later on said this, it's not just about method chaining. That's a common tool to use, but fluency is more than that. But do you know a fluent API when you see one? So I've got five examples here of various uh, APIs, and we're going to come back to these through the talk. So give yourself a little moment to look at them, and hopefully some at least are familiar to you. Don't worry if you don't understand the exact behavior of all the examples. We're interested in the shape of the API, not exactly how it works. Is there, in your mind, some form of progression as we go down the list? Is something changing between the top examples and the bottom examples? If so, what is it? I'm not asking specifically now, I'll cover what I think it is, but have a think about what it might be and what's changing as we go down the examples. So I believe that as we go down, we are achieving something that we might call fluency in the API. And this would come just from a linguistic point of view. The lower examples seem to read a bit more like an English sentence. And I apologize that this is only talking about English APIs. I have not experienced fluency in non-English languages uh, for APIs, so can't talk about that. But something is changing. But what is that? Can we analyze it? Can we talk about it? Can we think about it when we're designing? One thing we can do is look at the verbs. What verbs are being used in the method names and how are they being used? In the first examples, we have very simple verbs, put, map, filter, etc. We're letting the parameters that we pass bring the semantics to the operation. A map is a very simple structure. Its semantics are primarily coming from what you put in the map. As we go down the list, Things like an assertion can assert about specific data structures. It has an opinion about what we're doing, and it expresses that through more complex verb phrases in the actions it takes. We assert about things. We contain exactly this thing. We're adding context to the verbs we're using. They become more specific. But we can also think about parameters. What, what is it about the parameters we can infer if we knew nothing else. If we only can see the API itself, can we infer anything, infer anything about the lifetime of the parameters? When we build a map, it's not obvious from the map API that we're building it from static data or runtime data. Uh, when we stream something, we might be streaming a constant set of values through a runtime filter or mapping function. But with the examples further down, we've got more clarity about which, a, which of the parameters the API expects to be chosen at compile time, 
versus chosen at runtime. So you can see there's this progression where we're going from generic to specific. They're all chainable APIs, but we go down the examples. We become more specific, and I believe that's what helps it become appear more fluent and perhaps natural. So I'm going to give you my definitions here. They're not intended for you to take them away and use them yourself unless you find them valuable. But I would refer to the earlier examples as cascading APIs. They are chainable, and they are designed to allow you to make your operation in a single statement, but they do not require it. And to me, a fluent API is a cascading API, which is designed that you can always express it in a single unbroken expression in a single statement. But why do we care? Why is that seemingly simple distinction important? What does it give you? How does it inform your design choices when you're thinking of APIs? So the value proposition I came to was this. Domain-specific operations come with extra complexity, whether it be understanding what regular expressions are, understanding SQL statements, and so on. You have to do something when you're thinking about those operations that adds to what you're already thinking about as a coder. If you then split that operations across multiple lines, you're sort of multiplying that complexity. So you wouldn't want to see SQL statements built up over lots of different bits of code in lots of different classes, because if you happen to look at one part of the code in isolation, you can't reason about it so easily. And sometimes you can't reduce that complexity of the operation, but you can try and localize it. And I believe that since fluent APIs are a good pattern for localizing complex operations, they should be a pattern you go to when you're designing domain-specific operations. A well-designed fluent API makes domain-specific operations understandable and maintainable. But there's other things we can talk about rather than just the fluency. There are other design choices you can make when thinking about cascading and fluent APIs. One of these is type uniformity, which is whether or not you return the same type of object at each point in the chain. Homogeneous APIs return the same type of thing. Heterogeneous APIs can return different types. Neither is better than the other. Homogeneous APIs are good for optional parameters where you can vary the order of method calls. Heterogeneous APIs guide the user through a series of distinct steps uh, for more complex things, and they can help you reuse, excuse me, reuse existing uh, common APIs. Yeah. There's another issue of fallibility. Is a well-constructed API that you're using able to fail even if everything is used well? So a map build operation can fail if you tried to give it a key which maps to two different values. That's a runtime failure that you can't necessarily decide upon at compile time, and you might want then any terminal build step to reflect that strategic choice. So immutable map used to just have a build method, but people found that confusing because they didn't understand, oh wait, it can fail to build a map, even if the code itself is fine, at runtime, we might have a failure. So you express that with perhaps variable amounts of methods with different strategies. Uh, but if you have an infallible API that can't fail, uh, string building, if you don't throw exceptions in your two string methods, you will produce a string. And you can have simpler methods, similarly named methods. Reusability is another feature. Can your API be split and reused? Obviously, this applies to cascading APIs primarily. I hope not too many people have been caught out by people splitting a stream, as we see in the middle example, and consuming it accidentally twice. This is something which does happen. Um, since a fluent API should be in a single statement, it should be less of a problem to create one-shot APIs if they're fluent. Mutability is sort of related, whether or not you're mutating the same object as you move down the chain or creating a new object each method call. 
immutable APIs can be safer because you, they're naturally thread safe in all sorts of ways. They can be split, but of course you can end up in a loop having churning lots of short-lived allocations, which you might find problematic. And one of these techniques is to then hoist the uh, partial result up into a static variable, which is long-lived and can be used uh, repeatedly without additional allocation. But when we talk about mutability and we talk about this splitting, it comes up with the point that you might, when you're thinking about the API, what you think of as a cascading API might really be a fluent API in disguise. So there's this pattern, which I've not seen a standard definition for, which Kevin Brillian from Google calls a fluent utility pattern. And it's this immutable fluent API, which produces the object you want to use and can be split. And we don't consider the use of that object as part of that API. And then we talk about just the creation of the object itself as a fluent pattern. But you can't always take a cascading API and split it because in the case of truth, where you're asserting something about runtime data, you're immediately passing a short-lived object in as your first parameter and it restricts the scope of everything in the chain from there on to being short-lived intermediate objects. You can't hoist them into constants and statics, makes no sense. So these are tricks you can do for some cases, but not for others. And another thing to think about is optional parameters. How do you express that? In quite a lot of fluent APIs, you see just optional methods. You can call this method or not, depending on what you need to do. But this can lead you to problems. So for example, stream has a method which I would genuinely say has a slight design error in it, which is the parallel method. And what you think of the parallel mechanism is a whole different story, but the method itself doesn't take a parameter. You have to call it or not call it. Now imagine you wanted to implement conditional parallel streams. You're now forced to split the stream and then conditionally call or not call the method. This is not a fluent API. It's a cascading one. In Flogger, I was very careful when designing it to make sure that every method had a parameter which would act as a no-op. It would essentially disable the action of the method. So you would never have to choose to split a logging statement up to conditionally apply some behavior. You could always apply a parameter which disabled that behavior. And if we take the design choices we looked at and apply them to the examples we had, we can see that perhaps there's a progression. From the blue to the green, some of these choices seem to be more fluent, we might say. I'm not saying they're better. Cascading APIs are perfectly good. Use them, they're great. Fluent APIs have their advantages too. But if you're designing a fluent API, you might gravitate to choosing some of these design choices first, um, but you should use what works for you, obviously. And we can see here that Truth is a very rich, expressive API. It's heterogeneous. It is immutable, which means it could be split, but it's designed not to be. So it counts as a fluent API. Um, but the immutability does give you some safety in the cases where people would split it. Flogger is a mutable, homogeneous API for reasons of not wishing to churn too many allocations for log statements that often don't happen at all. So, as I've said, some design choices that we've talked about feel more suited to creating semantically rich, maintainable, domain-specific fluent APIs. And let's talk about what we, I hope, most of us think of as the benefits of good fluent APIs. They encapsulate domain-specific operations. They're good at it. You get discoverability in your IDE. You're seeing what the next step is. It's a very easy thing to discover as you work through it. And you can hide the intermediate types because nobody's chopping your statement up in order to reassign them. For certain things, you can get very efficient, lazy, and shortcut evaluation out of it. And for Flogger, it was essential. It reduced the combinatorial overloads of log methods. And it lets you, uh, get, a, you know, get, get the log method overriding 
working for Varags and auto boxing removal. And for truth, the heterogeneous API is very good at presenting a very structured, uh, well-lit path for making clean assertions. But there are, some value, there are some downsides, potentially. If you write a fluent API designed not to be split, you're telling the user, you should have everything you need to call this API at the moment you need to call it. It should be in your hand. Don't force the user to go off and collect more data via a separate mechanism just so they can use your nice one statement API. Um, and at some point, people will split your API up, deliberately or accidentally. So consider runtime checks or static analysis to avoid that if it's going to cause any problems. And if a Fluent API doesn't do everything a user wants, it's like a framework. They feel a bit trapped in it. And it will be frustrating for them. So they'll, they'll hack around it and work around it, and we don't want that. So consider giving them alternative APIs some kind of escape hatch. Fluent APIs are a narrowed API. We restrict how users interact with them. It provides a well-lit path. But well-lit paths are only good if they go where people want to be. Some quick tips and tricks. Um, these are things which, in roughly in order, I think, are uh, valuable. Think really hard about method naming. The difference between good and bad fluent APIs is very often uh, how methods are named and how carefully people have thought about them. Parameter scope, method ordering, also important. If you have required parameters, put them in required methods. Uh, you, you know, things that, things that are needed, don't leave them optional for, to be forgotten. Let the problem domain inform what you're doing. Don't try and make a fluent API for a non-fluent, non-domain specific problem. Fluent APIs are not the end goal. They're just a tool to use, and if they work for you, use them, and if they don't, do something else. So, with that, I think I have a couple of minutes for a question or two, and leave you with a couple of links. Uh, so, please, if you have a question, we have a microphone, and yeah, raise, raise your hand, we'll get a question. And if you want to talk to me afterwards, the, the uh, angry red panda is Hi. Yeah. Hello. Um, yes. Do you have um, a regret that you have introduced into an API and they say, oh, no, this was really wrong? Many. Okay. <laughs> that would be a whole talk in itself. Oh, okay. um, certainly in Flogger, there are some APIs which we, uh, at Google, we had a very, very uh, rigid sort of API design process you could go through. And there were entire meetings where we would spend well over an hour talking about the naming of a single method. Um, this, is, this is how much you have to get it sort of right if you know you're going to open source it and so forth. It really matters to, to care about a lot of this. So there, there's been a, so much discussion about method naming, it would, <laughs> it would, it would scare people out, honestly. Any more questions? If not, I think we are approximately on time. So. I'll let you go and grab your lunch if you haven't already. Thank you very much. <laughs>